Hello everyone, I'm Jack, I'm another one of the Hydrate core developers. I'm going to talk to you today about our vision for GPU code generation uh, with Hydrate. So, let's go work. Nope. Alright. So, I'll start by talking to you about what the current HPC landscape is and why we've chosen to start targeting GPUs now um, and <laughs> for the second time <laughs> uh, and then go into a bit of a deeper dive uh, on uh, how the, the design philosophy behind uh, what we're doing for GPUs and then a little bit of implementation details for those who are interested. Right, so I probably don't have to tell most of you, but things like a, uh, a bespoke continuum mechanics simulation can take many, many person years worth of effort to develop and maintain. Um, the cost is very, very prohibitive. You need leading expertise in all these very different areas. And the software that you end up building, this bespoke software, can be very big and very difficult to maintain and extend. Uh, so we, uh, you, you can double all these problems when you start thinking about adding a GPU layer to this. Uh, and as most of you are aware, we uh, manage this issue by a separation of concerns. So we have these high productivity languages, domain specific languages, things like UFL, PyOP 2, 3, 4. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we use code generation. So for an idea of what, what the trend, trends in HPC are, I'd really like this, this table because it sort of shows various different trends. So a while ago we used to have a national supercomputer called Archer. It was per node 24 cores. You've got about half a teraflop. Memory bandwidth was nearly 5 gigab uh, gigabytes per second. Uh, and the typical power draw was 260 watts. And then intermediate between uh, that and the next national supercomputer, there was Isambard. More cores, more flops, about the same memory bandwidth, different architecture, interestingly. Um, but the general trend you see as you go uh, forward in time is your core count is increasing, and whilst your uh, your total uh, memory and your flops are increasing, your memory bandwidth per core is decreasing, and you should notice as well the architecture is not constant there. The, ar the architecture is also changing. So you can take this to its sort of natural uh, progression. Another thing quickly to say on the power draw is these machines are consuming more and more power. So if you want to get to exascale, we're going to have to think about a more efficient way to do it. So we need to start thinking about uh, arithmetic intensity and algorithms, redesigning our code to take advantage of that, take advantage of the hardware, so this is things like instruction level parallelism, and as I alluded to before, we're really going to have to use GPUs to get to exascale in the immediate future. There may be machines in the future that won't, but if we're targeting exascale now, which we are, this is something we really, really have to consider. Uh, and for some idea of context, this is not some high power GPU um, from a massive HPC facility. This is just in my workstation, and you can see this is taking that previous table to its limit. Many, many, many cores, I'm not sure they're, they're, they're not the same as uh, CPU core, um, you're getting uh, about <coughs> the same number of flops as old Archer, but the memory bandwidth for core now is really minimal and you've got a much smaller typical power draw. So that's sort of where things are going in, in HPC land. What's happening in, in fire rate land? So I've got everyone's favourite example on the, on the board. This is a modified Helmholtz equation solving a 3D domain creating a function space. I think most people here are familiar with this, but this is a part of the piece. We can see an entire simulation on a slide. Well, what's going to happen in the future when we want to offload to GPUs? So we've got, on the left here, is the code you saw on the previous slide, and on the right here, oh no, hang on, this is wrong. <laughs> on the right here, I believe this might be the first presentation to use PyOP3. Um, so, we've had a bit of a rethink. We previously were putting all this infrastructure into PyOP2. With all Connor's efforts, it seemed a uh, complete waste of time adding it to PyOP2 and pushing that forward if it was going to be immediately uh, replaced with PyOP3. So we have working code in PyOP2 that probably won't be merged. 
um, because it will go, the, we're going to concentrate our effort onto Pipe 3 and a bit of redesign. Not too much has changed. So, going from CPU to GPU, we've changed what? Five lines there? Uh, and this is, this is really the point. The, the abstraction we're going for here is you will create a target device and then you will control the offloading in your FireDrake script with these context managers, which tell you where computation should occur. So you can see that here with the offloading GPU. And at least initially, uh, we're going to be uh, trying to assemble one forms matrix free um, operators initially. Uh, sorry, constructing, yeah, um, but matrix, in a matrix free. When you're matrix free, it turns into one form. I see what you mean. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, you, you as the user, will get these wonderful, wonderful things. So, it's not going to be significantly different in the FireDrake script, at least, from your, uh, in, uh, your current simulations. The memory management, importantly, this is the hosted device copies that you get, which are very, very expensive, will be our responsibility, so it won't be the, the user's responsibility. You'll have the same flexibility, we hope, with the discretizations uh, that are available, as on the CPU, large solver choice, thanks to Petsy and all the work that's going on in Petsy land uh, for GPUs, and the ability to maintain the portability between your computer and a high-performance computer. Uh, so just a bit of a deep dive on the code here. So. Uh, we at the top here we're importing from PyOP3 mm -hmm. the uh, offload device. So in this case, for an example, I've chosen CUDA device. We're also planning on targeting mm -hmm. OpenCL for a wider range of graphics card options. Uh, so we import that and set set up the device. Instantiate this as a GPU. Uh, this will, in the relevant blocks, change the underlying uh, ray type um, when you move between the host and the device, and this is covered in Piper 3 mirrored arrays, which are coming soon. Uh, and then when you actually want to do your offload, or when you don't want to do the offload, you uh, include your code in these context managers, these with blocks, and you tell the offloading function which device you are targeting. And as I said before, focus now is on matrix free. So, how is this being done? at the implementation level. So the, the plan is to follow the dependencies. So our key dependencies here, assembly, um, we're going to go down the pipeline FireDrake, PyOP3, um, which then is using Loopy, and Loopy targets C code for CPU, CUDA code for NVIDIA-based GPUs, and OpenCL for any OpenCL-supported uh, driver. Uh, and likewise, on the solving side, we have Petsy. So we have FireDrake. We have the wonderful solver options dictionary that go to Petsy. And then Petsy has this wonderful suite of external packages as well as its own internal solvers that it can use for solving problems. Uh, and this allows users to use their own hardware, even if they don't have an NVIDIA GPU. So this is the reason we're not just targeting uh, CUDA uh, and to be able to deploy that code on HPC. So uh, to choose the illustrate the difference that is going on in the background. What you currently have on a CPU, in Loopy, uh, you, you'd have something like the NumPy array, but when you're using the GPU, you will use the PyCuda GPU array and OpenCL arrays, depending on your uh, device, and that will all happen behind the scenes uh, in the Pipe 3 layer. And then on the Petsy side, where you would have previously had on the CPU something like a Petsy VEC, this will now be a Petsy CUDA VEC or a Petsy VNCL VEC, which is compatible with the uh, various subset of solves that work currently on GPU. So are those the same data structure on the different names? Uh, on the Petsy side or on the... Well, between the two. So if I, because I'm going to assemble, then I'm going to use that thing in Petsy, right? Yes, yeah, so we're going to have, have the, the same, we're not going to be like converting between different types. So I'm confused. Well, Yes. So you can have a PyCuda GPU array which is pointing to the same piece of memory as a Petsy CUDA back, is that? Yeah, that's the, okay. yeah. Sorry, right. that's, that, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's the, the table right across what you see. Yeah. Um, 
so for those who aren't so, so familiar with um, using, using GPUs, you have the concept of memory that lives on the, the host, which is usually a CPU device, sorry, let's, let's use the phrase CPU, uh, and device memory, which is on the GPU. And the, the expensive bit, at least at the moment, uh, is copying between the two. So uh, we'll, we, we will try to minimize as much as possible these copies. So what we have in Pi OP3 is a lazily allocated device um, memory. So when you declare um, functions on uh, in your script, you have this lazily allocated device uh, pointer, uh, device memory that will only be instantiated once you're doing things with it in the offloading block, which is what this diagram is, is supposed to be uh, demonstrating. So when you start assembling things, then these will come into play. Uh, likewise, when it comes to solving, uh, so these, the device pointer is now treated as, say, a, a Petsy GPU VEC. Uh, the solve can occur entirely on the GPU and only if or when that is required, again, on the CPU will the copy actually take place. So this arrow here is a copy if required. So in this example, we've done the solve in our offloading block, which is taking place on our GPU, and now we want to print the norm of this on the CPU for whatever reason, but just to demonstrate what is what is going on here. Um, I've got Pi OP4 there, that's <laughs> actually a typo. <terrible. laughs> Don't think about it. <laughs> so, the, yeah, so as I uh, said earlier, the, the VEC and uh, MAT, MAT3, PETC types will have common memory with the Pi OP3 uh, types. Um, and these will be combined then with the available GPU-based solvers and preconditioners that are available and will become available in PETSI. And at least initially, we'll be limited to the um, solvers that will make matrix-free. So it eliminates things like AMG, but Firedrake has very good GMG infrastructure, geometric module grid. Um, but we need to sort that out on the, on the GPU side before we can use that. So just to sort of summarize, GPU support is very much still a work in progress. I can't show you, show you how to turn your problem into uh, um, something that will run on the GPU today. Hopefully, in the near future, that will be possible. Um, whilst we, uh, we're exploring the branches, the early profiling with Piper 2 code looked very promising. We didn't have, uh, I've got the results to hand for, for this presentation. Um, but a lot of what we were finding when we were evaluating this were a lot of the assumptions that we made on the CPU side don't hold the GPU, so there's a bit of restructure, more restructuring that needs to happen on the firebreak side before this is uh, ready. Uh, and as I've already said many times, the previous working Piper 2 code is now being refactored into Piper 3. So, yeah, that's what we've got to look, to look forward to in the future. HIP, Corpus, or OpenCL, and you make so you are giving one hardware specific support, only CUDA, you are removing HIP, and you are using OpenCL instead of Corpus for targeting any hardware. Why these choices? Uh, just because that's what we have on the Loopy side, so we can generate um, and easily share the, the, the pointers basically. So the, the pointer that we have in the like, NumPy array style array in, say, PyCuda can then be used with the Petsy CUDA VEC. Um, then I don't think there are uh, currently uh, any plans on the Loopy side to target things like Cocos and Sickle. If they do in the future, maybe. I don't think that those would help. Right? So if you want, for sure, having HIP would help, considering having the GPU, maybe. So that that's okay. So that that's true. That's a slightly uh, different question. But Cocos is a different layer of the system. Right? Yeah, yeah. No. So I was asking two questions at the same time. One <laughs> was HIP, and the other one was Cocos. Cocos. I know that Petsy, the Petsy team is pushing more Cocos than OpenCL. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But Cocos is not the same layer as OpenCL. So I hope you understand. Well, it's, you just treat any any kind of GPU, right? 
Yeah, well, this, is, this is what they claim. It's a, but it's a kernel image, it's not a, like, it's not, um, it's not a target image, right? Kerkross is like supposed to be an abstraction layer above that. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we don't have a call, cause for that, call there, right? So we, we, we Kerkross, the, 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 the Kerkross abstraction layer just isn't something we have a need for in there. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the hip is different, because hip is like, well, which lowest level target images do you go to? And, well, we don't currently have a form compiler that can create. There's no particular strong reason. Um, the, yeah. Jack, what's your plan for the smoother for your, multi, your matrix three multi group? Is it Jacobi? Yes, I think that's that's it's, it's a little way off the path. So you need to be able to assemble the diagonal of your yeah. matrix. Yeah, that would that that's like a, a nice simple start. But that that's okay because so. If you think about how Fibrid works, um, basically anything that you can shove inside a kernel is fine. Mm -hmm. The stuff that is not supported is matrix insertion. And so the, the, the funny thing that the kernel, the, the um, compiler does to give you the diagonal kernel, that's fine. Okay. Uh. Any other questions for Jack? Thank you, Jack.